What are you reading? Goethe. Plato's Republic. What is the meaning of life? Apparently, Plato. Our leader liked Plato's ideas. Plato, Platonius. I'm a professor at a graduate school called California Institute of Integral Studies, which the campus is in San Francisco, but my program is increasingly online. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness Program. Yeah. We have about 100 students, and they're uh, mostly not in California at this point. Uh, around They're around the country wow. and uh, in Europe and Asia uh, increasingly. So it's, it's an exciting time of um expansion for for the program afforded by you know the online modality and i think accelerated by by the pandemic yeah both of those things right feed into uh there's there's like a type of person that loves philosophy and if they can't find it locally they were just kind of sol mm -hmm. but now that the internet exists you can read heidegger with someone that studied heidegger in europe and then mm -hmm talk to a Platonist that lives in Toronto. And it's really this like golden age of connectivity for, for philosophers in some sense. I saw you yesterday. I'm not quite finished with it because it just popped into the little YouTube feed, but talking to Wolfgang Smith and it's like, how awesome is it that he's able to like share his thoughts in a dialogical form online with people. And, and, you know, I was, I have a friend who also is, is, a big part of like the Verveki cluster of, of wisdom lovers. And mm -hmm. we're both like, this is awesome that, that we like Wolfgang Smith is just free and caring enough to want to share these things online. And your, your work as well. Like I look at Heidegger as like an alien that beamed into my reality. And I'm like, I don't understand this. All my friends like him. And uh, mm -hmm. how do I get a handle on this? And then people like you put, breakdowns about him down or give a lot of examples and and it's so cool that that kind of stuff can be accessible i would have never gotten through 10 pages of heidegger and with just me in a bookstore or a library but yes. again this kind of uh video format and and the telecommunications of the internet really allow people to not live in their little bubble um yeah i mean it it can do many it can work in different ways, right? The internet sure. can certainly reinforce our bubbles, but it can also, when used um, more consciously, uh, break us out of our bubbles. So it's it's a it's a profoundly mixed bag, I would say. Yeah, it might be the Antichrist if the revelation was beamed into human history as a truth. It might yeah. be like the the machine that you can bullshit yourself forever with. Um, I think McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan, actually speculated about about the electronic media uh being the electronic media and he didn't have the word internet yet i don't think but i think he did speculate it that it would either be uh the um the body of christ or <laughs> the antichrist or maybe you know some weird uh in some weird way both depending on yeah how you engage in it so <laughs> Yeah, new technologies like elongate the tails of what's possible in both directions. So uh, mm. fertilizer was invented because of World War II. And also like one chemical different was the gas chamber um, mm. that eradicated like 12 million people. So technologies are like these neutral things that go in both directions. And then we live in like the long tail is actually kind of free where if you were into a really niche thing before in the fifties, you'd be kind of stuck, but now you can be in a, in a community of uh, Teletubby lovers or Platonists really. Like it's the whole, the whole yeah. gamut. Right. Um, For sure. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it's uh, given us the opportunity to connect. Um, I know you've been doing YouTube for some time yourself and I've, I was noticing your, um, I guess you're doing sort of follow-up videos after, after Socrates oh, cool, to, yeah. to John's new series. That's great. Do you know Layman at all? Layman Pascal. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you did. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. he's a joy. Like again, like meeting, meeting these people through, um, I, I played a lot of like magic, the gathering and some competitive video games as a kid. And like, so subcultures are not new to me mm -hmm. and it's cool that there's this like 
digital wisdom subculture uh, and meeting people like Layman. I, I actually got to meet him in Thunder Bay when I was up there at a conference that John and some other people did on consciousness. Nice. And it's like, oh, again, like the 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 capacity for fellowship and philea is profound watching your videos on steiner like the little group it even kind of like it's evolving and new people pop in and everyone adjusts to that new person and it's yeah. it's so cool um if you have the skillfulness to kind of use the technology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i've been at it for gosh almost two decades now um trying to use social media mostly youtube uh to to forge philosophical community and, and fellowship. And um, it's been mostly uh, a wonderful experience and I wouldn't be the person I am without that experience mm. just because of the connections um, that it facilitated and the way that it shaped uh, my own intellectual development, just to have access to not just information, but people, you know, to be able to talk to people, uh, to thinkers yeah. who, you know, who are very much there and can respond to your questions. And unlike, you know, reading being in time. And um, I don't know that I necessarily would have wanted to be a student in person with Heidegger, given the whole political side of his thought. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to be able to, when you read a, a book published uh, by a famous intellectual, and then maybe reach out to them on Twitter and spark up a you know, dialogue is really, really special. And it's a privilege to um, exist in a time when that's possible. Yeah, really well said. It's, it's, um, I think that that's the original model of how wisdom and intergenerational knowledge were like person to person and the books and the technology reinforced. And then we flipped that. It's like, well, you mostly get things from books and technology. And then if you're lucky, you have a person to talk to. And mm -hmm. in some ways, right, COVID even exacerbated that because now even like the most fundamental college experience became this digital and, and universities love it, right? From the profit driven standpoint, they go, what? We can fire more teachers and still make the same amount of money. This is amazing. We can just record and then have people play video series rather than have, you know, this face-to-face right. -face transition or transmission, I mean. And uh yeah, it's cool. It's uh, I like Zach Stein's like we're in a time between worlds where people that use this medium creatively can actually like like John. John would have just taught people that went to University of Toronto, mm -hmm. and now he's built seventy five hours of lectures, and people are all the time saying like, "Oh, I grew in this way. I love learning all this cool stuff." Like I, I mean, Heidegger, um, Corban um gun Han, like all these thinkers i would have probably never maybe by the end of my life gotten to dabble with i'm just like way way earlier and in a way way deeper way able to connect with whitehead right i love i still don't quite appreciate him the way i think i could but it's cool that you have these little like hour talks and 10 minute talks and it's like oh cool someone that's kind of had a, a relationship with this philosopher is able to help me have a relationship with that philosopher mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely i mean um i do prefer the dialogue format but uh sometimes no one's around you know and so <laughs> yeah. i'll just talk uh extemporaneously monologuing and sharing ideas that have occurred to me and sometimes people find them interesting and, and helpful so that's nice <laughs> Yeah, why is why is dialoguing so important to human beings compared to like the monologue? Because Aristotle, like what we have of him, is very monologic. Uh, mm -hmm. But Plato and people like you and John Layman is a great example that like he loves that he sits with you and it's like expanding to just talk with these people. Why why is that different? Uh, I think. You know, human beings are social animals and we need each other to understand ourselves. And uh, language, I think, initially, I mean, this is a controversial subject. Uh, different uh, perspectives are, are of interest to me. But I would say if language evolved initially as a means of communication, it very quickly, you know, between people, um, and that that 
intersubjective uh, context is what forged the capacity to be linguistic uh, and in some sense to refine our thinking capacity in light of that linguistic skill, it then becomes um, something that individuals can use. I mean, in some sense, it individuates us uh, what to gain the capacity for language, but then we can begin to engage in dialectic uh, sort of internally with ourselves. But that skill, I think, rests upon um, a foundation of dialogue, which requires going outside of yourself. And it's only once you've you can only master dialectic, I would say, if you've if you've first understood dialogue and the engagement with another person. But it's it's very easy to become um, more dialectical, where you're sort of spinning your own wheels, and you can lose touch with the importance of being in dialogue with others because dialectic can become a closed circle, mm -hmm. and you it's important to you know um, come back down from the heights of of that abstract. Uh, internal exercise to test your insights among a community of other inquirers. And so, um, but, you know, dialogue itself, I think, keeps our, our thinking and our ideas open. Um, it, it reminds us uh, that we need to, to test our ideas um, in, in conversation and that there's always going to be other perspectives that you know, we might not have considered just on our own. And, but even when I am, you know, recording a monologue uh, to upload to YouTube, it's interesting the, the way in which even an imagined audience can elicit different kinds of thoughts, uh, different connections from me, um, because I'm considering how what I'm saying will be heard and how it will be heard by different audiences you know and so that i think is um really a catalyst for deepening my my thinking you know so even if i am monologuing i'm still in a way with others um and it has an effect on my thoughts so yeah yeah that's awesome um i i love uh the idea that antisthenes internalized socrates and uh Marcus Aurelius, like he, he went through all the, the initiation rites as well as internalizing Epictetus's wisdom. Um, and then I, I, I really, I'm sure I've thought of this before, but you really made me remember, yeah, like who your audience is, right? Part of Socrates's coolness is, and Jung, Carl Jung as well, is like different aspects of self to different people. So he's not going to give the same encounter to a sophist that he's going to give to a young tyrant, for example. Um, right. And right. yeah, when you're on YouTube or uh, giving a sermon, like talk to a lot of religious people and it's, uh, it's kind of easy to forget that there are lots of types of people. If you get in this routine, like you, I just reify Heidegger and then justify all my thoughts about him to this reified image of him. And then all of a sudden, I'm this very static creature rather than, um, yeah, the, the vitality of other people is so profound. And, and like animals must have a little bit of that because they do some communication and definitely like birds and whales and, and different species have a lot of communication and maybe senses of time. But we're like the the mega version of that right like we can uh same person in one day can like hold a baby talk to their grandmother and teach classes to different age groups or something like that it's like oh my gosh what a those are definitely not the same types of places or people um, yeah yeah but i i do think heidegger is right when he he says um <laughs> rather than you know thinking that we possess language uh language possesses us you know we're kind of inside of it uh and it is the it's the the ocean within which we swim this this symbolic sea you know and so we're yeah we're possessed by it i think uh more than the reverse yeah i have a degree in economics and like i took this awesome master's class with uh there's a guy in duke he's like the uh steward of the history of economics in the u.s he's like a caretaker for a small museum and it's like his whole life's duty or something and economics is so wild because there's different points where they're like 
Everything is salt. We should just care about salt all the time. And no, no, it's precious metals. So if we use all of our other resources to take over a place that has precious metals, we'll be really rich. And now we're in a time of like human capital and intellectual capital and things like that. And, and so you're framing like the language you're using and the maps you're using completely populate your perspective in ways that you're unconscious to. And then all of a sudden someone new like David Ricardo shows up and he goes, oh, there's opportunity costs. And then it ripples through the old ideas and, and starts generating new things. And, um, you know, the dismal science and Malthus just dominates this era. And it's uh, we forget that. Right. It's so easy to. Uh, yeah, lose touch of, of how much of, of our being is being shaped by language. Um, uh, do you who are your like top three favorite philosophers that you like? Just because Heidegger's already come up a couple of times. Um well Whitehead is up there. Uh Schelling and uh Friedrich Schelling, the German idealist. And um I guess I'd have to say Rudolf Steiner, though he's he's a philosopher, but um I think is more um engaged practically and socially than um what one would typically how one would typ typically imagine a philosopher um but i think <laughs> he's a philosopher so yeah, yeah i like that it's ironic that practical and philosophy have become like antagonistic or or odd because it seems like they started so close together especially socrates like you almost don't care about any knowledge it's character and relationship right. um right. yeah yeah, I mean, that's just a function, I think, of the professionalization of philosophy in the 19th and 20th century, where um, it became less a way of life and, and more uh, more like a job. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I really, I, I, that's one of the reasons I love John Verveke's work is he's trying to um, push back against that um, profound profoundly limited understanding uh in the contemporary world of what philosophy is as though it's just one among the subjects that one could study in uni at university um and one of the less uh, uh relevant uh subjects in that it's not going to help you get a job or anything and so it's increasingly <laughs> you know philosophy departments are increasingly being closed for that reason and you know, I think instead we should recognize it as something that uh, touches everything, not only that we think about, whether we're engaged in in science or economics or, uh, you know, any subject of human inquiry at the theoretical level. But yeah, it's, it's also um, important for our daily lives and for our sense of um, what's ethical and how, how we ought to behave and and on the spiritual level in terms of, you know, practices of self-transformation and, and ultimately world's transformation that, you know, philosophy is really at the center of everything as, as the love of wisdom and wisdom as this, uh, I think we have to think of wisdom as a being, as like Sophia, as a goddess. And we are, uh, as philosophers in love with this, this being, um, and and it, it our lives are oriented um around the existence of this being and the the calling of this being and so um you know i love i love that uh you know verveki is is trying to remind us of this this ancient um pedigree and and what what philosophy meant used to mean and and should still mean yeah like you said so much there that was like worthy of caring about and thinking about a lot and um just like orienting right just even changing little orientations from like a cliche thing like money or status to compassion or um young again like he talks about um directed kind of thinking or or uh, dc schindler i don't know if you've read any of his works in his books uh -uh. He talks about like the just the instrumentationalization of reason mm -hmm. and how there's just contemplation in and of itself is beautiful is awesome is human 
And if you're only using your reason as a means to an end, uh, like a kind of a tangible um, Thrasymachus kind of way, you're, you're, that's, it's like the first step towards pure relativism when you're, well, what's in it for me? What's the end of what you're doing? Why are these stupid humanities professors taking up all this space when there could be scientists dissecting things and business people profiting on those dissections and um, mm -hmm. thingifying the world in, I'm reading this book. I think I emailed you about it too, like uh, about Alan Chadwick. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know him at all? He, he did a lot of stuff in, in uh, uh, California. Hmm. Uh -uh. No, he, he was a student it. of Steiner's uh, in like in person. And he, got the attention of this philosopher named Paul Lee, who writes some cool stuff on Thumos. That's how I heard about him as I was trying to learn about Thumos. And um, he, there was these five, I think, new community colleges in like the 50s or 60s that popped up in California. And mm -hmm. so this professor knew this, this guy, um, Alan Chadwick, and he was awesome at gardening. And he used like the lunar cycle. And instead of just going like, okay, how can we, commodify one crop which was kind of trendy at the time he's like no what's the interrelatedness of things and how can we make the most hardy resistant gardens and he was doing it all without science textbooks and without um that that kind of materialist uh synthetic point of view and he was like kind of a socratic character that these students would go to their university and get bored by these monologic lectures that kind of reify materials. And then they go outside and they'd say, oh, there's this cool gardener who's really wily and alive. And if you talk to him, he's not chaotic, right? He has a method. There's reasons why he's doing everything, but also there's this vitality that he has. And um, so, so it's really cool. They talk about Goethe a lot and, and the, kind of contrast between vitalism and materialism uh and it's very biographical so it's 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 fun to be yeah, in the poetry wow. of it all thanks so much for bringing uh chadwick to my attention i definitely should have known about him um just found his wiki page oh yeah he's got some great stuff there's like some lectures he recorded on youtube there's a channel oh, wow. dedicated to him and Wonderful. there's a really good i'll, I'll email you to you uh kind of some some dedication to him the, this author paul lee in hindsight realized how unique of an individual he was and has just been gathering as much kind of uh artifactual data about him he met the zen monk there's a great story about this california monastery he visited and um yeah i mean i'm just seeing apparently his grave is is marked by a stupa at the green gulch farm uh zen center uh not far from me here in yeah California. i was gonna say yeah <laughs> very cool yeah <laughs> just like there's people like that alive like henry thoreau when i was a kid I, it's i was just like oh this is so cool he he did a little bit of things with society but he had this dream he had this this other way of mm -hmm. relating to the world where it wasn't this fixed thing that was figured out by europe that you just follow this pattern and then you right. fill your house with goods and then you die one day. Um. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean the, the trend, the transcendentalists, um, Emerson and Thoreau, I think were both like, um, the, the last line of defense against this, uh, tendency towards professionalization in, in philosophy, uh, in the, in the mid 19th century there. Um, you know, Emerson was like this itinerant lecturer who uh, he, you know, if if he hadn't spoken his mind at Harvard Divinity School, might have ended up being more in the pro pro professoriate. But um, they kicked him out <laughs> because he 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 just had a more expansive um, sense of of what's what philosophy was. So, yeah, it's interesting to look at the egos of the deans of people that rejected like applications from pragmatists and people like Emerson, like wait, what? You had the opportunity to have these people in your faculty and your own egoic disagreement like ruined that potential for the students, for the college, for the whole. And you don't really see that as a young student. You don't, it's yeah. it's kind of hidden in the, the margin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be fair to Harvard, they did allow people like William James and uh, 
um, Josiah Royce and Munsterberg and, and others uh, to all teach together, uh, you know, in the early, late 19th, early 20th century, which was just um, amazing, an amazing time. Um, but, uh, and then Whitehead, of course, taught at Harvard for more than a decade, um, about 15 years. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the, the, America has some really cool contributions to philosophy and the history of philosophy and especially um world war ii pushed all these geniuses like paul tillich who also worked with this guy uh alan chadwick and mm -hmm. encountered him in california um mm -hmm. i believe and it's like holy moly like these people were just walking around on this soil it wasn't just a bunch of like rebels and hillbillies and colonialists kind of hanging out here and mm -hmm it's it's exciting it's really these thinkers um have such breadth in their in their views of life and you know if you read their some of their works just purely analytical what's the information i can gain again that was like a crutch of, of me trying to encounter heidegger was like where's the definitions i need i need <laughs> some clarity and then i had enough friends compassionately like no no it's it's more of like a poetic relationship or something Right. Um, mm. uh, so yeah, that's, that's cool. And why do you like, uh, we'll get to Steiner for sure a bunch, but why do you like, uh, Schelling? What's, what was like a, maybe powerful or attractive about him? Yeah. Well, in incidentally, uh, Tillich wrote his dissertation on Schelling. Um, and so he was, uh, f philosophizing in the wake of Immanuel Kant, who, um, sort of, revolutionized uh, philosophical method in in the 1780s when he published the critique of pure reason and um, a couple other critiques too, where as Kant put it, he sort of um, accomplished the Copernican revolution, the equivalent of the Copernican revolution in philosophy by putting um, human consciousness or subjectivity back at the center of things where Copernicus in, ast in astronomy had decentered the human being, all of a sudden Kant is philosophically recentering the human being. And this created this problem where um, you, from Kant's point of view, we don't have access to reality. We, we only have access to the phenomenological construct of our own mental activity, right? space and time and all the categories like causality and substance and so on are just produced by the mind, you know? And so Schelling's inheriting this, this Kantian method, which on the one hand is really emphasizing human freedom. And it's almost like it's often said that uh, the German idealists at this time were realizing spiritually what the French revolutionaries we're realizing politically this sort of enlightenment um, um, birth of, of the significance of human freedom, right? But Schelling also wanted to understand the relationship between human freedom and the natural world. Um, he wasn't satisfied with the idea that nature is just this appearance uh, and that our knowledge of nature is just a subjective construct. Like he thought that, no, <laughs> there's a real world out there and he articulates this philosophy of nature that is dynamic and evolutionary and much like Whitehead would later articulate um, based in process rather than, than substance. And he puts human consciousness back in this uh, evolutionary context and sees mind as something which naturally emerges from cosmogenesis, right? And it's it's almost an inversion of Kant, um, though he he's not trying to um, refute Kant. He's trying to carry forward the spirit of Kant's philosophy uh, beyond the artificial limitations that he felt Kant put on on uh, what we could know. And so his philosophy of nature is just mind blowing. I love it. Um, I can't I can't get enough of it. And then later in his career, he also made some important contributions to our understanding of myth and um revelation and the nature of of religion in a more esoteric sense um 
And he, I think, lays the groundwork for Jung's depth psychology, actually, and, and oh, Jung's wow. understanding of, of archetypes and um, the kind of mythological process that un- unfolds throughout human history as um, the evolution of the God image. And um, Schelling's yeah, late lectures on mythology and revelation really um, made Freud and Jung possible, I would say. Huh, wow. I've never, I've, I've, I've never studied Schelling. I know of him and I, I've encountered a little bit of some of that aesthetic nature interaction that you could find in him, but, but I didn't know he was a forebearer of young. And uh, so therefore Corban and Hillman. And I, I love that world. The, the, the rupture between perception and cognition uh, that kind of happens after 1200 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um and then like the imaginal can start to kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again or, or myth, but it can go so wrong too, right? Part of why Europe is rejecting myth is because it can, like John says, it can be both an affordance or parasitic processing. And, and yeah. yeah, so that's, that's really cool. How did he, um, what's maybe one thing that someone would uh, appreciate about Schelling's view on myth? Like what's a piece of that not to, so, I mean, one thing I think is important um, is, well, he was a kind of esoteric Christian and he definitely um, was Christocentric, uh, but he he was inclusive of um, the pre-Christian uh, spiritualities and, and religious traditions in the sense that he saw this mythological process uh, unfolding the kind of evolution of the gods, as it were, um, from, um, you know, going all the way back to the um, Babylonian civilizations through Greece uh, and the way in which the mysteries, uh, like the mystery of Eleusis and and other mystery rites, were part of a uh, gradual revelation of what eventually was fully revealed in his view by the incarnation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so while he's definitely saying that, you know, Christianity is the true religion, he's also um, showing how you can't understand Christianity without seeing it as the culmination of a mythological process and so he's i think reintegrating what would be called the pagan traditions with christianity uh in a in a way that's more inclusive than what many christians would be happy with uh nowadays who are more exclusively nope this is a sharp break with everything that came before um <clears throat> oh, wow. and so yeah he has a deeper understanding of the continuity of um the evolution of consciousness, let's say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you deny someone myth, you are turning them into like, like dry, facile things. And um, a lot, it's it, Corban. I was reading a couple of days ago was, was saying like part of his, his life's mission was to revivify images in islamic culture because when you have images like we've talked about you can dialogue with them they're they're um they're things to see through and to live through and um there's some good psych uh research kind of in like the religious uh applied psychology realm where like if if i learn something wise like i find i figure something cool out i'm like oh this is this is actually better than the other thing and i try to just put it in a list form or i put it in a drama form and people encounter it as a story or as a collective ritual drama, they're more likely to remember it and be able to apply it in its dramatic form, right? Our episodic memory holds meaning better than our semantic memory and transmits knowledge better. So if you start denying like the episode and the myth and all that kind of stuff, you lose this vitality. And I, I think there is like an evolutionary uh, world, right? Cause, Cause Christ was Jewish and steeped in both that time and history, but also that mythology of Grecian Judaism. And then he becomes, after 40 days of fasting and encounters with these, you know, uh, unconscious or supernatural forces, this uh, 
uh, he has a clear vision of who he is and his place in the world. And he goes and, and lives this mythic life. Mm -hmm. And it was within the context of Stoicism, Epicureanism, Judaism, so like the, the political system of the time. And if you if you pull that out, like it, it becomes a totally different story. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just living in a continuation. Like it's not like, oh, well, it's 20 after the hour. We're done with myth or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's that's awesome. That so shelling is is big into that in Europe. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think there are some important lessons about um, pluralism, and um, there's a sense in which the modern world needs to recover the ancient uh, uh, sense of of pluralism, right? Like there was way, in some ways, more um, religious tolerance back then <laughs> than there is today. Um, in some senses, in this, like there was a willingness to, they would have these translation tables in like the ancient Roman world where, you know, this, this city states or this region's gods translate to the, these names in this region and then translate to these names in that region. And it's like, oh, okay, you call it that we call it this here, but like fine, whatever, you know, um, whereas with the rise of this more like strict monotheism, um, there's a sense in which no, there's only one true God, and it has to, you have to use this name, and like anyone who doesn't use that is heathen. Uh, so, yeah, we have much to learn, like by maintaining a sense of um, continuity with the evolution of um, you know myth and and religion over the course of history. So. Yeah, I think uh, Schelling is only becoming more more relevant to the sorts of problems that the contemporary world is is facing. I would say. Yeah, yeah, the 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 European issue of that is so profound because, like in Japan, you could worship Shinto gods, Buddha, and Christ at the same altar in the same home, and they had no problem with that. And then here, that seems like that'll start a war in Europe or something like that. Like it's so the opposite, and. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I look at archetypes and myths and, and that kind of, it's like, okay, well, what's, what's symbolically happening in those people? Like, I don't want to impose my meaning on it. I want it to kind of have a, a play with me more than, than the other way around. And then you go, oh, wow, love is like this, or war is like this, or, uh, mm -hmm. wisdom and tactics are like this. Um, yeah. And just an, under, an understanding of like the mystery of spirit as, <laughs> uh, having many faces and manifesting in many ways. And like the idea of revelation being continuous rather than once and done. Um, so that we, we get a more participatory sense of what the sacred is and uh, uh, a more pluralistic sense of, of the various modes of expression um, through which spirit can enter into and transform the world, you know? So we, we've really, um, clamped down on the on the the options uh in the in the so-called secular modern world um and you know it's it's so tragic if the way the relationship between the um abrahamic religions judaism islam and christianity because early on when you know muhammad was was still alive um and the the first muslims were were uh, in dialogue with with Jews in the in the um, you know Middle East, uh, they recognize the the shared sense of um, lineage and and the way in which this was this was not two separate religions that should be at war uh, with one another. And um, boy, have we fallen far from that early potential for a more peaceful <laughs> relationship. Yeah, the, the way prophecy used to be interpreted more as like an insight, um, you can read Plato as like a, a great example of someone that really respects epiphanies, like this revelatory moment yeah. rather than this piece by piece or purely dogmatic kind of like, well, nope, we just don't question the tradition. We stay here. The idea that, um, yeah, the Greeks, one of the cool things that I think liberated the Greeks from the, that dogma initially is they just didn't have a magic book the way the other groups did and homer mm -hmm. kind of does that but there yeah. was so much more flexibility 
it wasn't a book culture. originally, right? It was just memorized by poets who had slightly different ways of performing it each time. So yeah, it was more oral. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in, in like Hebrew culture, it's like, we have this all written. There's no, we can't ask questions because it's, it's physical, but it's also not participated in the same way. Um, writing in general, I think does that it reifies thought in a weird way that like spawns hermeneutics and all these different disciplines. Like, Oh, how do I interpret this book? I know it's good. It's dominating yeah. my thoughts, but I, I mean, can't to be ask fair, the, questions. you know, the, in the Jewish tradition, there's this notion of the, the midrash where there's disputations about the meaning of scripture and they'll argue endlessly about what, 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 what the book means. And, um, you know, the, in a similar sense, before the stories were written down in the books of the Old Testament, they were orally transmitted. Um, but, you know, at some point, because of how uh, the Jewish communities were constantly being um, invaded and taken captive and all that, like they had, they wanted to write it down so that it didn't get lost. And then yeah. undoubtedly the written word um, ossifies the living spirit of a, of a tradition. Um, but um yeah, I think there's more room in the to to make a generalization in the Jewish tradition in terms of midrash for arguing about how to properly interpret scripture than there is in 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 the Catholic Church or in many right. Protestant denominations where it's just like, what do you mean this? We already know what it means. Stop asking questions. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so, learning about the history and learning about like the debates of what order the New Testament should be in. And uh, like some of these uncoveries that they found in Egypt of gospels that are yeah. outside of the norm. Wait, this is 80% the same as these other gospels that are, are codified and sanctified by the Catholic church, but the Catholic church disavows them. Like, and, and there's a logical disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah. it's tricky, right? Like it's, you want wisdom. So you're excited to have it and it carries your culture, which John's work, like you need community culture is so meaningful, just shopping and having, you know, all of your luxuries taken care of is not enough for the human soul. Like Ru Rudolf Steiner, I think you quoted one time said like, I want to be hungry. My soul is hungry for wisdom, like things like that. You can't just have, uh, you know, Maslow's lowest hierarchy of needs and be a happy human. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think like, it's cool, like Steiner to bring, maybe bring him more in contemplation, like reading the Timaeus or reading um, these theosophanic works. Um, they exercise a different muscle that like, if you exercise it, you then can like apply it later um, in a way that doing math, you then have the capacity to do logical thinking and to take parts and transform them and get outcomes. And there's something really cool about contemplative texts and rituals, even if they don't have any factual validity or something like that, they, that what they do when you engage with them uh, in a kind of imaginally oriented way is, is really kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, theosophists and and anthroposophists that the, the 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 approach of anthroposophy that comes out of steiner's work is very much about um recognizing how like just as we learned to read and before we knew how to read printed text was just like you know marks uh random marks on a page like it means nothing but then you learn to read and all of a sudden it's like you've grown a new organ of perception and a whole new world opens up to you uh these sorts of spiritual practices and contemplative methods are an indication that um, this capacity to grow new organs of perception doesn't stop there, right? You can continue to cultivate ways of seeing and, and knowing that could potentially um, give you insight into worlds and realms that you otherwise would know nothing about uh you wouldn't even think that they existed and so you know steiner has this understanding of imagination not just as uh a faculty for fantasy and make-believe and literature or whatever but that it can be cultivated as an organ of perception to reveal another layer of reality that is otherwise hidden to to the physical senses 
and there's other organs he calls them inspiration and then intuition which reveal even deeper layers of reality and through spiritual practice we can begin to cultivate these and it's you know it sounds spooky and weird but you know when when oral cultures first encountered the written word they thought it was magic you know oh yeah yeah i think thomas aquinas um people accused of witchcraft because he could look at a book not say things out loud and then yeah. know what was in the books like wait you internalize speech they didn't have that thought they right. thought he was like using demons and and all sorts of weird stuff and yeah of exactly. course now we look back and go no he just internalized that capacity mm -hmm. um yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this this kind of view of dynamic history and dynamic cultural growth. And also, I loved in college, um, like we've lost access to to clear engineering things that like cultures could do, wax casting and building aquifers and arches and things like that. They still don't. I mean, maybe this has changed since I was in college, but still don't quite know how the pyramids were built or how Stonehenge got where it was. But it's like. Oh, yeah. You know, we could also lose that, like you're saying, in our perceptual, um, our our invisible human capacity. No, oh, absolutely. Like, can you imagine with uh, contemporary um, industrial modes of of engineering and and architecture and and material production having a structure last five thousand years? Like, of course not. It's a no way. It, they they they're designing and building things to last maybe fifty years. You know, and it's just. We live in such a disposable culture that uh, not only doesn't want to build things to last longer because of the economics of it, but doesn't even remember how. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really so cool even just to keep talking about meaning in life to care about something that will outlive you. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's what every parent does. There's like, It's really weird for a parent to want to live as long as their kids. Uh, they should want their kids to live longer than them. And doing that with a Gothic cathedral or anything. And, and these things, like they were tracking comets and weather patterns and that whole way of, of relating to the world is, is such a minor view in most people's kind of mm -hmm. what's important. Yeah. Uh, and and so uh, yeah what what spiritual practices do you do on a regular basis or do you find powerful do you meditate or do you um clearly use the book reading to access things you've never experienced before i mean i think i would be i am a strong advocate for just reading just read um it is the most important spiritual practice available to everyone um, I mean, hopefully most people at least learned the basics of reading in, in the, you know, in Europe and North America and, and, you know, much of the world now is literate in a way that wasn't the case, you know, a hundred plus years ago. Um, so that's, but it, but we're losing that ability. Um, it's gone down in our lifetime in America. We're the first generation to lower the yeah. literacy rate, which is shocking. And you see successful people are always readers like to be successful and not be a reader is so rare mm -hmm. it's it's uh and again it's like contemplative it's not that you have to be for use you can definitely like for use get so much out of books but just encountering plato or encountering a gardener or someone who wrote about voice um, or someone that wrote about physics related to jazz you go mm -hmm. oh wow that opened up a whole new like sliver in reality. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. And then, you know, um, Jung's active imagination and just taking seriously the insights about oneself and one's cultural milieu that can come from giving free play to the imagination and, um, you know, developing a relationship through active imagination to aspects of one's psyche that might otherwise remain unconscious. Uh, the extent to which we can develop a playful relationship to those aspects of the psyche that are otherwise, otherwise occluded, I think ends up affording us more freedom because we're not victims to unconscious forces, but rather those, those forces, those archetypal beings, if you want, become, become our friends, you know, and when, when they want to be seen and, and acknowledged, and if they are, then they're not going to, um, 
appear to us as fate, right? And in the way that Jung would talk about, like, you know, you can repress what you don't want to look at and think that you've done away with it, but it's always going to sneak in the back door. Uh, and, and yeah, and and we'll experience it as our fate, as something that's just determined to befall us. Um, so active imagination is another important one. And, you know, I would encourage people to take seriously Socrates's uh, statement in, in the Phaedo after he's been sentenced to death by his own uh, fellow citizens that philosophy is learning to die. Philo philosophy is, is practice for dying in the sense that the, the form of inspired thinking active activity that the philosopher engages in is exercise of one's soul capacities. And uh, the soul is, is easy to, you know, dismiss in, in, in the modern, you know, scientific context as just a, um, a holdover of, of earlier superstition and, um, pre-scientific ways of thinking, but the soul is just this, the stream of, of, um, experiential, uh, occasions of experience to use a Whiteheadian phrase that, that we can trace back, you know, maybe some of us have memories from three or four years old, but you know, like it, it gets a little hazy before that, but it's, it's that stream of experience that constitutes who and what we are through the course of our lives. But we know at some point it's going to end and at least as, as we know it. <laughs> and I think engaging in deep inquiry and loving wisdom, never feeling satisfied with any finite scrap of knowledge, but inquiring more deeply as to its meaning and its its context strengthens the soul such that we begin to get some glimmer of what maybe awaits us or the new identity that we may transform into upon passing through the threshold of death. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't claim that anyone can have proof of the afterlife, but I think we can gain glimmerings of some kind of continuity as a result uh, of engaging life with a philosophical attitude. So um, it's not a concrete practice. There are practices, Steiner has some great ones that would um, be specifically geared towards um, helping us move through that threshold of death and approach it with consciousness, um, kind of similar to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, the Bardo Todol, which is something that someone can read to prepare because it can be chaotic and scary otherwise, you know, at the moment of death. If, if, if you're unable to keep your wits about you, as it were, um, you might not... Um, enter into the bardo or the middle space between death and a new birth as the Buddhists would imagine with their sense of reincarnation and, and Steiner would imagine as well. And so there are practices like memory exercises one can do um, before going to bed every night to just do a recall exercise of the events which transpired that day. And as you build up the capacity to do that, I mean, even if you don't want to take the metaphysical leap into belief in an afterlife. You're going it's to a be safe space, Matt. Yeah. You can do whatever <laughs> well, you want. I'm thinking of other people on, you know, in the audience who are yeah. might, might be skeptical of that idea, but as just a memory exercise, sort of reviewing your day before you fall asleep every night is going to make you more attentive in the passage of, of your day. You know, you're going to notice more things and you're going to be less, absent-minded and, and whatnot. So it has a practical payoff, even if you do want to bracket the idea of preparation for dying. Yeah, we don't value our memory enough, nor the thoughts we feed our mind and the way we relate to those. And mm -hmm. um, I find all the time, my last few deeply felt kind of experiences or thoughts show up in my dreams and I, as a kid, had a photographic memory and I still have a pretty strong memory. And like when I'm doing a lot of spiritual practices and very calm and centered, I can remember like the most tiny details and the most like long sequences of events. It's, it's episodic. It's not semantic. So I'm not remembering like a bunch of facts, but I can remember what the book 
I was holding looked like and then see what was on the page episodically. Mm -hmm. And like, and you lose it too. It's memory is not a static thing. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, if you practice recalling more, you're going to be more conscious in your future and in that present while you're practicing that the same way you lift weights or um, I mean, the imagination as a faculty, I think the more you as an adult go like, oh, that's stupid. I'm never little kids do that. Uh, and, you know, overcome that and say, oh, that wasn't a waste. Actually, when I'm imagining how to act in any situation, having a stronger capacity to feel in to what's happening or feel into myself is um, just worth the effort of, of keeping that like you. Um, I love the idea of of bleed of of psychological bleed when if you do something so so much in your day to day you're immersed in something it stays with you in tomorrow and you don't have to I mean that's what church does right when you go into this container for 3 or 4 hours and it's ecstatic and opening and wisdom falls into you it can change you for a week and then you can come back and drink from that again and so, yeah, I think these imaginal and contemplative and maybe, maybe at the end, you know, you appear at a river and there's, you know, people with scales and there were, you know, you show up naked, like Socrates says, so you can't trick them with your clothes. And uh, yeah, it, it, that would make it even better for all of those things, despite their uh, practical value in our, our lived, whatever realm we're in right now. Yeah. Have you seen this Netflix uh, cartoon called Midnight Gospel that Duncan Trussell uh, created? I no, but I know Duncan right. Trussell. That's awesome. I'll check it out. Some cartoonist took episodes of his podcast and created these cartoon narratives around it. And there's one episode about this this poor creature that keeps dying over and over again and going uh, to to have its heart weighed by on the scales mm -hmm. and it just takes a lot of uh reincarnations before finally um you know the, the heart weighs less than a feather i think is the idea and um it just really dramatizes that that myth yeah yeah that's so us every day we wake up kind of forgetting what yesterday was like or last year was mm -hmm. like and yeah. then we make the same mistakes over and over again or the same mm -hmm. patterns um and yeah, the, the, it's it's so cool that we have the capacity to sense immediate things and reflect on past things. And when you when you do that, I mean, that's I think the aporia that, that Plato's dialogues produce a lot of times is like, oh, I'm that fool or in, in the Christian narratives, the uh, stories. Oh, I'm that worst example. And, and you see that in Zen as well. And just uh, it's so cool that we have um if we if we escape the clutches of the like political economic scientific reduced modern world and open up to more of these these aspects of our our human self uh how much and then you feel so happy in the world you have such different ways to connect to yourself to problem solve to view others uh oh that's really cool and uh, yeah so yeah go ahead well, just, yeah, it's happiness as contentment rather than um, all pleasure and no pain. I think people get confused about what happiness is sometimes. Um, it's it's a contentment. It's Aristotle had this great word, eudaimonia, good spiritedness. Um, it's more about balance and what, you know, the Buddhists would call it the middle, the middle way kind of um, happiness should not be identified with just um, pleasure. Like you're always just experiencing pleasure, like like yeah, life yeah. turns into a candy bar or something. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, it's tricky because pleasure is it feels good. Like it it it's it's nature's way of teaching us things across generations, and it's really powerful to go, oh that that bad thing, I keep trying it, but then I'm grossed out by it, so now I stop trying it, and oh yeah, that yeah. really good thing, like especially before industrialization when you could mass produce cupcakes um you go like oh yeah that fruit i should spend more time with that fruit because it's actually really good for me um right. but that's such a lower uh, the, like the philebus and and i mean every platonic dialogue just to some degree uh shows that as like the lowest 
uh, where we start. Like we're just wantons afraid of pain and desiring pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. And then cultivating like, like friendship, friendship to a utilitarian can actually seem like a waste of time. You'll meet people that'll justify like, oh, people are stupid. I don't want to be around people. I've done the math and, you know, it's much better for me to work a lot and have like a big house full of gadgets than cultivate relationships. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the instrumentalizing of everything that you were mentioning earlier. It's so powerful, right? Like when you when you look at the world that way, you can actually accomplish so much when you rip it into parts and look at like the pros and cons of them and how they interrelate. You can accomplish these like 23 step processes that turn uh, simple things into really powerful things. Um, but it's such a small fraction, especially now. I feel like the rest of humanity could just spend its time maintaining the level of technology we have and cultivating the inner life or the the dialogical life of, of interpersonal joy. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, it's cool to have a better, like a pill that cures cancer or whatever the, the next big thing is, but um, we're way far from the muck of the uh, Tigris and the Euphrates technologically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, technology has definitely uh, increased our power to manipulate the world, including our own, our own bodies. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think that it's fair to be, um, to re just totally reject it or to totally embrace it. I feel like, uh, we need to be, we need to bring more wisdom into our relationship to this technological, um, facility and, and capacity that we have because, uh, it's, um, profoundly creative and and the other side of that coin is it's profoundly destructive as well right and um heidegger recognized this about technology perhaps um better than anyone yeah what was his insight if someone had never read a page of heidegger like how does why is he so valuable in that sense um he would talk about the German is Gestell. It's in framing that technology enframes the world and and encourages us to imagine the earth as a standing reserve of raw materials or resources to be put to put to our human use, our industrial use. And this really undermines our capacity to find value in in the world and to appreciate the beauty of of the world um and i think it's a it's a perspective on technology that could easily lend itself to a um a kind of like luddite rejection <laughs> yeah. of everything um modern and i don't i wouldn't want to take it that far but there's so much naive embrace of technological progress today that I think the Heideggerian critique is important while also recognizing the sinister way in which Heidegger would deploy his own deep insight. Um, you know, for example, in the fifties or sixties, when he was still un unrepentant about his Nazism, he would respond to people critical of what the Nazis did by saying, look, your, your factory farming and your treatment of animals is no different than the gas chambers. And it's like, yeah, he was not like a, like a hardcore Nazi, but he should have been a little more anti-Nazi. I, I have his letters to his wife. Have you ever read that? I've read some of them. Yeah. It's cool because for someone like me that doesn't, didn't get him the, the, mm -hmm. the letter dialogue, I could start to feel his philosophy and it was very human. You'd see his thoughts, not as this like oh, sure. brilliant mind but they were kind of permeating like the way he talked about his wife and there was like a charmingness to that. And, and, um, and he talks more about like how he thought about Germany is like, kind of like, I hope this nationalism thing works out. It's kind of yeah. cool. And I hope Holderland is spread across, you know, the world. And stuff yeah, like yeah. That. it's important not to reduce people to these um, caricatures of like evil demons or something yeah, 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 yeah. you know the banality of evil you know is important to to remember in the sense that nazi germany could have and may become 
you know, America may become very similar to what happened in Nazi Germany. It's not that there is uniquely evil people. It was just a very human, we're, we're, we're all human beings are susceptible to this. And um, despite his anti-Semitism, you know, he was having an affair with Hannah Arendt and like, so, <laughs> who's a Jew, right? So it's like, he's a complicated person, but you know, there are certain things, uh, betrayals, like the way he treated his former teacher, Edmund Husserl, um, who was Jewish and bet betraying him when the Nazis rose to power. And just, I, I find Heidegger's philosophy profound and I find Heidegger as a person to be not worthy of very much respect, to be frank. Um, mm. But um, that's not to say I would just simply re you know, dismiss him as some kind of demon. I think it's important to acknowledge that he's a human being and has these complex inner conflicts, I'm sure. And, you know, I'm sure he was a nice guy to his grandkids and whatever, but <laughs> so was Hitler. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, people are complicated and we are different in different environments and at different points in our life. And are you know it's like the irony of like the accountant that has no good spending habits at home or uh the nurse that's really filthy at home or whatever it is yeah. like we're able to transcend and be hypocritical in ways that are kind of funny um mm -hmm. and and yeah I think you, like it's it's just cool i look at all of humanity as like a potential source of learning mm -hmm. and so I get really excited about the New Testament and other things and try not to get so like wishy-washy and new agey that I'm falling prey to self-deception in that sense. And it's sure. all great. We're all just in the body of God and things will work out. And <laughs> But it's, um yeah, that, that's Heidegger is tricky in that sense because yeah. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he had the opportunity to not be a Nazi mm -hmm. and was kind of sympathetic to, to them. Yeah. And I, you know, I would just say to qualify what I, my statement a little bit that um, some professors of philosophy refuse to even study or teach Heidegger's work um, because of his Nazism. I would say his Nazism makes it even more important to study his work so that we can understand how someone so brilliant could nonetheless have succumbed to that political temptation. Um and because especially those who are interested in myth and romantic poetry and ecology, I mean, there's so much about um, the blood and soil uh, ideology driving Nazism that I think is ecologically um, grounded and uh, the, the, the whole romantic movement ex given expression in Holderland's poetry is something that I find beautiful. And it's like, wow, how did this, how did these two things relate? Because uh, there seems to be some, I mean, lots of people have argued that there's a, it's a sort of one way street from romanticism to, and, and like Nietzschean will to power philosophy to Nazism. I, I wouldn't say that, but we have to study it closely and, and understand what connection there might be there. Yeah. yeah, German culture, it, like when I was studying economics and, and other things, like you you see the Portuguese, the the Dutch, the French, the British, the Americans, like there's all these different like ages that they grab onto kind of like that Western magic and keep taking over the world and dominating the world. And then the Germans don't get that kind of same view, but they were amazing in mining uh religion right like meister eckhart is is mm. like one of the best people to have ever lived and mm. and their philosophers like you're saying are like just so unique in the history of earth and then like the british empire was distant and they have cute little scepters and queens and stuff that we don't look at them as these evil tyrants the way we look at the nazis and people in that shadow um, yeah well we shouldn't it, let we shouldn't let the the imperial british off the hook though <laughs> no, no, both. Yeah, we should learn from from these these uh, tragic yeah. failures of. It's so tricky because if you become like this pacifist, this wisdom lover, and and like a compassionate person, it's easy to just say, "Well, I'll never do any of those things." But what you're saying is like, we should look at them and see like what what ingredients made that stew because we're also just ingredients that could become. It's so we're so blinded by ourselves and 
Oh, it's, yeah, it's so, so dangerous to imagine that evil is something out there that you, that, that you can project onto others. Uh, that's, that's itself the source of evil is this move to say that, no, I'm not evil. It's all, it's those people. Uh, because yeah, then, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. That is evil, you know, like that very gesture. And so we have to accept that there's the potential for evil in each of us. Right. That's part of what constant. This is one of Schelling's major insights. He wrote a book called Philosophical Investigations into the Essence of Human Freedom. And this, this, um, in, in every human being's heart is like this boiling cauldron that has the potential for good or for evil. And this cauldron is called freedom. Right. And without the potential to do good or evil, we wouldn't be free, you know? And so the cost of goodness and love and compassion is the potential for evil. And we're, you can't just eradicate this this inner um, capacity for evil in a human being without eradicating their humanity. He's they wouldn't be free anymore if they just were determined to be good and loving. Like yeah, yeah, that's yeah. not that's not what we mean by love. It's got to be a free deed, you know. Which means it could be it could have been otherwise. Well, and that image is true, right? Like even beyond its its power to shine onto that fact like it just really is true that it's so easy to talk yourself into oh they're not human like even young when you could find he was writing a letter to to Merche Aliad and he's like I'm so shocked that these black people have the same elements in their dreams as us white people and I studied expertise and you see uh Galton is family of Darwin awesome doing all these interesting things like he had access to the time and the money to do all this writing and also the father of eugenics and uh you know just this huge thought leader that resulted in these just monstrous beliefs and and young too and hillman and other youngians have have credited what keeps them humble enough to do the work they do is identifying with that darkness and keeping it inside so that when they see it in other people it doesn't turn into this fantasy it stays at like, oh yeah, that's that's human. That's that's mm -hmm. um and and it's kind of paradoxical because you think, oh no, Christ was this shining beam of light, so that's what I should aspire to be as a good person. But if you lose contact with your your with all of what mm -hmm. you're talking about, then it's so easy to pervert. Oh, this, is, this is Jung thought the greatest danger in the world was the projection of shadow. You know, isn't it and, though i mean like we all yeah. do that when we drive or when we ah you <laughs> you forget like oh wait i do that all the time or did 10 years ago or whatever it is mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. when you undo that it softens you like i teach young people and when i can remember like not knowing a lot and being goofy about my thoughts i'm way humbler <laughs> and easier to like be someone that can help them grow than when i'm like don't you have the knowledge I have? Come on, like hurry up! And you get impatient with people. Um, it's it's so subtle that that uh, mm. that fact that you're saying that that idea that you're pointing to. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, you you get this um, just in terms of how to understand and relate to evil in in um, the work of like J.R.R. Tolkien in Lord of the Rings, when in Mordor, the orcs start fighting each other, like at the end when Sam and, and Frodo are getting closer to Mount Doom with the ring, evil eats itself, right? Uh -huh. Like we have this sense, no oh, evil needs to be defeated. Like the good needs to defeat the evil. Well, when the good has this hatred for the evil, it, it, it breathes life into that shadow dimension in in the good ones the good the people who think they're good and they become evil too and so it's like nietzsche said if you share if you stare long enough into the abyss you know watch out because it stares back uh and i just think what tolkien does by showing the dynamics of evil as self-defeating is a really important lesson um yeah why like how how can someone that doesn't have that view um well it's like it's like an expression of um when jesus says turn the other cheek that can seem naive and like mm -hmm. well you're just gonna let the evil ones like kill you and like he did actually yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh 
it's, I think, both a reflection of how an attempt to defeat evil requires that one become evil. It's like, and a historical example would be like, you know, the United States and the allies to defeat the Nazis and the ally, the, the Axis um, needed to invent the atomic bomb and drop two of them on Japan. And you can say, hooray, we defeated the Nazis and brought an end to the war, but at what cost? At what yeah. cost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it raises this question about these dynamics of, of the the role of evil in history and the the cycles of revenge that keep war going on and on and on and on because no one yet has been willing to turn the other cheek. No one yet has been mm -hmm. willing to let to let evil destroy itself by simply being responding to it with love in the short term. I mean, this was Gandhi's philosophy in the yeah, short yeah. term. You might get beaten in the street. You might even die. But in the long term, there's this truth force, this satyagraha of, of, of loving action that is going to win out much faster than attempting to create the atom bomb to defeat evil, because that's just an unleashing more evil that you're going to need to defeat again. Right. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, the, the collective cultural memory of things and just like there's something different about doing something versus talking about it and thinking about it that once you kind of demonstrate it in reality, you're just widening the probability of that happening again in such a different way for good, right? When Socrates shows up, you can now copy him and grow. Um, but yeah, I, I like what you were saying there, the... Um, I was talking to Paul Woodruff, the philosophy professor at University of Texas, who mm -hmm. wrote about reverence and all these other, like, he's just an amazing writer and has translated all these cool Greek books. And I, we were talking and he said, um, you know, if, if the U.S. would have treated Russia with compassion at, right at that moment when the Berlin Wall fell, we mm -hmm. could be in a different reality right now. We celebrated. We're like, ah, oh, the West is right. We are the best. If, yeah. if, if you would have reached across with brotherhood. And, and done the kind of a self-humiliating act, like we kind of did with Japan. Japan now is such a different relationship with the U.S. And, and um, you know, it wasn't like a pretty clean picture or anything, but, but it was more of a friendship that happened there over time rather than like a humiliation. And now, you know, what is it, 20 years, uh, 20, 30 years later, the fall of the Berlin Wall, we're like, oh, wait, it didn't stop there. What a bummer. And in fact, it's even more tenuous now, maybe than it was then. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so that's that's profound. That's really um, powerful. Compassion is like such a unique force in human beings. Like John talks so beautifully about agape, and how if you can really just get enough love into you that you can start giving it out to the world, mm -hmm. it's it's so powerful. And I mean, you could see it even transform animals uh, and just. Yeah. The earth, you know, the way people can plant down and regenerate seemingly dead parts of the of earth. Like we, we, yeah, yeah the, 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 that's agape is the divine economy and it's not a zero yeah. something, right? The right. The, the, the weird synergy. Get. Yeah. Yeah. Was it fish, fusion? Fusion is the energy making mm -hmm. it's a cosmic mm -hmm. fusion. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. I, I don't know. Would you do this again? I don't want to just, I, I could ask you a million questions. I love learning. Yeah. I, I need stuff, to, but... I should probably wrap up here, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd love to have another conversation. This was a lot of fun. I love the, um, the questions you're throwing at me and what it's elicited. So yeah, cool. we'll, we'll do a round two. Awesome. I, uh, love what you do online and, uh, yeah, I love the talks you've had with people that I know and thanks so much for making the time with me. Oh, it really my pleasure, Robert. Thank you. Oh, cool. Have a great rest of your day, Matt. All right, you too. Take care.